Thank you so much, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege and an honor to speak here today. I will indeed talk about data. And I come from the Karolinska Institute, uh, the medical university in Stockholm. But I do have another qualification beside my IT achievements in the last years. I served as district medical officer in northern Mozambique on government payroll. That's why I learned the importance of money. And I did also uh, spend 20 years with African institution studying food insecurity and health in remote rural areas. So it was indeed a pleasure for me to be invited here. Now I will give you the macro picture of the world. I'll talk about health, money, and population. Let's start with the basics. Here the world. We are 7 billion people in the world. Each doll here is 1 billion. Where do they live? Well, 1 billion is in the Americas, 1 billion in Europe, 1 billion in Africa, and 1, 2, 3, 4 in Asia. This is really the most important part of the world. This is 2011. Now, we have to pay respect to demographers. They are much better than people in economics and health are in predicting the future. In fact, they know pretty well what will have happen the next 40 years. And they say we are going to be 2 billion more. 1 billion more in Africa and 1 billion more in Asia. So already now, you can see where the world will be in the future. Huh? It used to be the Atlantic, then the Pacific. The Indian Ocean is coming up, you know, as the main sea. And, and, and in, in 50 years more, the mid-estimate for the UN population division is that we will be 1 billion more, and that will be in Africa. Africa is predicted, by the end of this century, to have three times as big population as Europe. This is more or less the basis. I will come back to that in the end, but I will address three questions that comes up over and over again when I lecture at high level in corporate sector and government. The first one is, how much progress has there really been in Africa? All this talking about the numbers. This is the first thing I hear. The second is, well, isn't it better to get rich first before spending a lot of money on health and education? And the third is, mainly from African government, isn't it good to be as many people as possible? Look at China, well, they are doing, and they are very many. Why shouldn't we be as many? I'll address these three. We'll start with the first one and look at, at, at uh, if there have been progress. And let me show you one of my favorite charts here, and it's this one, where I display every country as a bubble. And I have on this axis the number of babies per woman, two child families, eight child families. And on this axis, the child mortality, 100 dying per thousand born, 200 and 300. This is 1961, more or less the year of independence of most countries in Africa. And you can see the color of the bubbles is shown here. The dark blue is Africa. The green is Middle East. Here the green is Middle East. Uh, this is South Asia, East Asia. This is Europe. This is America. It was very clear in 1961 that there were two types of countries the developed, industrialized, or Western, whatever you call them, and the developing, newly independent countries. They had more than five to six children per woman, and child death rate was from 150 to 300. How much has happened? Has it really got better? Well, let's have a look. Here we go. Ready, steady, go. Huh? Can you see, as years pass by here, this is China coming down here, starting family planning, going towards smaller families there, and it's the death rate of children are coming down, and then family sizes starting to decrease. Look at the Arab world here. What a speed they go to small families. And the African countries start to follow one after the other. And we are now into the last 10 years when Africa really speed up. Look the speed here on which these bubbles are following. There we are today, a completely new world. 80% of mankind live with around two children per woman. But there are still countries which live up here, and we can see what sort of trouble they have been going through, civil strife and war and tragedies. That's we have. But the world has really changed. Let me repeat this and look at some individual countries. I prepared one sheet here. I would like to show, of course, Tunisia, eh? since we are here. I will show Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, Ethiopia is here. I show Tanzania there, Ghana there, Bangladesh here, and of course, 
to honor Julia Frank, I picked Mexico, and then I took France here, the old colonial occupier of Tunisia. <laughs> which at that time said, oh, they'll never make it. They want to be on their own. And I still, to this day, have students in West Europe that ask me, was independence any good? I mean, this is the sort of preconceived, ugly ideas which still exist. Let me just show how good independence was. Huh? Here we go. Ready, steady, go. Can you see how they are doing here? Mexico is decreasing child mortality. Here's Tunisia. Look at Tunisia, what they are doing. They are decreasing child mortality. They are catching up with Mexico. They, the African countries are now following in Bangladesh. It's an absolute miracle that happens in Bangladesh. And Tunisia is overtaking Mexico. And they are coming down into this end. And they are catching up with France. Let me take away the others, and you will see what they don't even understand still in Paris. Eh? That Tunisia made it all the way. They made it all the way. Eh? And look what Africa has been doing. This is Ethiopia in the last years, the speed, but going in different directions. Ethiopia, Ghana, and Tanzania. The magnificent drop from control of malaria and other good intervention, but still 5.5 children per woman. So you can see that somewhere between Bangladesh and Mexico, all the countries go. This is quite clear that this is the way to join the modern world. And most of Africa is here between Mexico and Bangladesh. Now, too much about health and population. We have ministers of finance which are looking for the money. Eh? So let me, let me move over here. And, and first, before doing this, I would like to show you, however, inside the countries, what happens. Look at Ghana. They were there. Four children per woman, a child mortality going down to these lower parts of two digits. And I split Ghana into its wealth quintiles, into 20% pieces of the population. Here we go. The better off 20% in Ghana are already here, in the center of the modern world. And the worst off are here close to Afghanistan. See, within the successful countries in Africa, you have one-fifth in the top, which are just like anywhere you go in the successful part of the world. And you have one-fifth in the end, which is like uh, Afghanistan and Ghana is then distributed quite equally in between. If I split Tanzania, this is Ghana, I split Tanzania, the same thing. You see, the difference between Tanzania and Ghana is not that big. I strongly advise you not to look at country average, but distributions within countries. The best 20% of people who are more educated, better income in Tanzania, they are better than the second in Ghana. And the worst in Tanzania is not so different than the Ghana. But the Ghanaian economy has pushed people, and socioeconomic development has pushed them more forward than backward. And, and it's very clear that when you come to these relatively low child mortality levels, then decreasing family size is very important. And I am not advocating that as a policy for eradicating poverty. I say what makes sense for family makes sense for nations. It's free access to family planning and to control of birth spacing and the number of children the families want, that's the way to go. I think many countries are embarking on a very clear policy for this now, which will work. Now, it's very clear that we have had progress. Look here. In the distant past, way up there, we had two parents on average in the world, and they got six children. This is if we go back to history. Why didn't the population grow then? Well, because four of these children died before growing up to become parents themselves. This we call the old balance. Now we want to be down here. Two parents get two children, they survive. This is the new balance. This is what the world is heading about. Some countries are still here in the middle, where you get five children, one die, here you have the fast growth. Two parents leave four children that grow up. This is more costly. They can't afford to invest so much in education for these two, neither can the country. Eh? And, and this is really where you will have the move over here. It's astonishing, and few have realized that the population growth in the world today is fastest in Congo and Afghanistan, where we have the highest death rate, we have the highest population growth. Congo will double in 25 years to become 120 million people bigger than Japan. It, it's an astonishing. If we don't 
get what we hope, a peaceful development, economic development, social and health development. Now, so it's clear, an enormous progress, and now faster than ever, but diversity within countries. But as you saw, even the worst of parts of Tanzania and Ghana is better than any country in Africa 50 years ago. Isn't that interesting? The worst of 20% is better than any country average was in the past. Now, uh, I'll move over now and look at money. This is where the ministers of finance will get their indicator. Eh? Income per person in dollars, purchasing power dollars, 400, 4,000, 40,000. 1961, <coughs> and here, number of children per woman, two, four, and six. Once again, developed country, rich, with small families, developing world, less income, and large families. Now, do you need to get rich before you get small families? This is the simple question. And here is the answer. They are dropping across the line. Can you see? Eh? What China? What China? Going down with first health improvement, then small child families, then Deng Xiaoping, and then the economic growth down here. This is the fast line down here. Here they start with their economic growth, and they continue here. And you have many countries following this way. It is not going rich first and then small child family. I would really like to emphasize that what we are seeing today in the world is countries moving down here. Look at China. Eh? They hit two child families, and then they have this fantastic economic growth. Because it sort of makes sense. And it's not the government imposing things on the family. It's rather the family getting the support from the government for implementing their own decisions of the family size. That's what it's about. Eh? And if I would look at this, I could still see here Ethiopia. Let me split on this map. Ethiopia into its quintiles. Here I have it. I split Ethiopia, and you can see <coughs> the first quintile, the 20% with highest income in Ethiopia, are always down now on the fast lane. In fact, university trained women in Addis Ababa today have 1.3 children per woman, just like Japan. It's an enormous difference within, whereas the worst off is still like Congo. So it's quite interesting that, that, that the, the difference is enormous. And here I ask myself, what does universal health coverage mean? I am at the, you see how old I am. I know Alma Ata. I remember primary health care. What's the difference between primary health care and universal health care? Primary is very easy. It's what you should do first. Huh? Universal, it's about the universe. The problem is that there are many black holes in the universe. And I think that many ministers of finance may be considered about this. We have to be more clear when we talk about universal health coverage. Does it mean that everyone should be covered with the basic? Or do, does it mean an idealistic vision that everyone should have everything? I would say investments in health. Hmm. Investments in health is not only investment in health service. It's investment in education, in electrification. A light bulb is almost as good as the vaccines for child survival. And investments in, in gender equity. Those three things are very important for health outcomes. Then the health sector also is important. But not everything in health sector is investment for better economy. There's also consumption. If I have a problem with my hip, and I'm soon 70 years old, and I need a hip replacement. Would that improve the economy of the country if that is done? No. It's consumption. Grandfather get a hip replacement. It won't help the economy to grow. If the children get treatment for their anemia, they can study better, that's investment for economic growth. If you control the infectious diseases, that's investment. It's not investment in health as such. Don't just pour money into the health budget. Work together to see that it goes into those eight bullets, or we've heard the priorities, that really makes the difference. This is the most important thing. Because there's no way Ethiopia can start providing everything here. In fact, I think Ethiopia has a very tough decision whether to get complete vaccination coverage there or start providing cancer treatment there. 
It's really, really not only cancer treatment and hip surgery, diabetes, hypertension. There's no PAP for, for hypertension. There's a lot of chronic diseases which is quite costly if you would cover them by government money. And you have to be very selective and know what to do primary in the universal health coverage. Now, what does this mean if we look like it from another way? I would say that money first, no. Basic